update uh, from last week's call, uh, and then we're going to move right into the core topic today, which is um, which we're calling Project Unity, and it's a uh, it's a proposal, an overview of a proof of concept that a number of folks uh, have been um, talking about actually since the start of uh, the Let's Get Technical calls, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, it's a it's the it's the go do part of Let's Get Technical in addition to the let's go learn part and share information, uh, which is also a key part of the, uh, of the whole purpose of the Let's Get Technical group here. Um, so we'll have a, a, a I think we have a, a we have a, a presentation and ideally uh, we'll have some discussion around it. This is really a proposal and the idea is for, uh, for us to start thinking about how do we apply some of these uh, ideas uh, and in a very practical way. And so we'll be uh, we'll be uh, presenting that, and and I'd like you to think about how it resonates with your work and your interests, and ultimately whether or not it's something you'd want to participate in. And then, time permitting, we'll give a bit of an update on what's coming. So, as I mentioned on last week's call, we showed a little bit of that. Uh, we uh, are beginning to build out a schedule of activities for the next couple of months, and we have about ten or twelve different <clears throat> opportunities to. Uh, for presentations and discussions that I'll share briefly with you and then give you a, a heads up on some things that are coming pretty quickly. Uh, so uh, there's one in a couple of weeks on, uh, on public safety and then um, another one on social determinants that we'll be talking more about as we go forward. So, so that's, the, that's the agenda. We, you know, we're scheduled to go through 1.30 and um, for those of you who can stay on the whole time, that's great. Uh, I know some people have uh, some other, other, other things that they're doing in their life. So I appreciate that. But um, uh, the conversations have been, been great. So the way we've been doing introductions for new people is, um, because it's uh, a little unruly otherwise, is if you just in the chat, uh, in the chat uh, on your navigation, just put your name in and I'll call on you. Um, and we'll just give a second or so to uh, a few minutes to say who you are, where you're from and kind of what's, what's interesting to you. And uh, terrific, a couple of folks started up. So uh, Diane Lacey, um, welcome. And please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself as we get started here. Uh, good morning. Um, I, act, I have, uh, work for Search uh, Organization. I'm information sharing specialist. Search has been doing uh, standardized information sharing for about 50 years, but our domain is the criminal justice and criminal history area. So, but a lot of that does intersect. We're starting to do a little get more on the edge of criminal justice to health services, so. I think you'll have a kindred spirit on the call here with you. I don't know, Paul, are you on? Yeah, Mr. Wormali also, so you yeah. know each other. <laughs> Hi, Paul. <laughs> Welcome. Hi. <laughs> um, okay. Great, thank you. Welcome to, welcome to the call. Uh, Tammy Jones. Hi, uh, I'm Tammy Jones. I'm head of product solutions for CareCom. Um, CareCom does terminology services for the healthcare sector. Um, we're an international company, so we do uh, terminology around the globe. Um, so I'm really excited to hear what you have to, to say and how this can all play into how we can help with this interoperability problem as well. Great. So is that is that uh, sort of in connection with LOINC and um, ICD-10 and all those as well? Absolutely. So all the standard code systems as well as being able to use your own, because we all know that those EMRs allow you to do custom code systems. So, but how do they map to a standard? <laughs> yeah. um, but it allows you, we have some advanced algorithms that help you map that to those standards as well. Great. Thank you. Great, great. I think uh, there's definitely, we're glad that you're on the call and I think we'll, uh, we, there's certainly m multiple topics that, uh, that touch that for sure. Uh, Avinder. Mr. Singh. Um, looks like your microphone is on. We're not hearing you. So not sure what's going on. Uh, you may need to dial back in or enable your microphone. I'm not quite sure. I know a couple of people have had problems with that. So we're going to, if you want to uh, sort of dial back in and try that again, we'll move on to Steve Ruth. Hi, good afternoon. Hey, this is Steve Ruth from SMC Partners in Connecticut, where health um, 
a healthcare sort of technology company that's working on a number of interoperability projects and solutions, um, including some work with our care and case management system um, and working to sort of interoperate that with um, sort of medical systems as well. So I'm glad to be on board. Great, hey, welcome. Thanks. Um, so uh, Tracy Anselmo. Hi, I'm Tracy Anselmo. I work with the Colorado Association of Local Public Health Officials, and we have a group here in the metropolitan Denver area that are working very, uh, public health departments, working very closely with their human services department, and my sister organization of human service directors to discuss this interoperability issue and how public health and human services and justice share their, their systems. So, very interested to learn more. Great, welcome, welcome. Um, uh, let me let me go back and uh, see if uh, Arvinder is back on, or have you been have you been mobile enabled your your voice your um, your voice yet? I don't think so. Okay, uh, hopefully you can join us. Uh, some I don't know if you need to just dial back in or just use the phone number here. Um, and then for uh, other folks who, who may not have access to the chat feature, uh, anyone else just jump in and say hello if you haven't been there before or if you're new to it. Who's up? Hi, this is Carrie Miller from the Office of Child Protection in Los Angeles. Hey, Carrie, what do you do in, in what do you do in Los Angeles? We are looking at data sharing around uh, child welfare, social services, and touching a little bit on juvenile justice issues. Thanks so much. That was a leading question. I knew what you did, but I wanted everyone <laughs> to know. <laughs> Welcome. Who else? Thanks. Anyone else new to the call? Or want to introduce yourself? Been a while? Okay. Uh, great. So um, one quick thing I wanted to do for folks is um, I'm calling this kind of news and newsworthy. Um, just to take a moment, if anybody is like in the middle of something really exciting that they want folks to know about or something that they've discovered or are in the midst of doing, uh, just thought we would take a moment, just threw this onto the agenda, uh, just to provide a second, just to give a little overview and not, not a sales pitch so much, but as a, something's coming up that you want folks to hear about or know about. If there's anybody that's interested, now would be a great time to say a few things. A shy crowd today. Okay, well, I guess it's work as usual. Um, I mentioned last week and uh, went through uh, one of the things we're doing, which I'm excited about, which I, I think uh, most people know about. We're participating in the Connected Healthcare Conference in Boston in a couple of weeks and uh, we'll be uh, attempting to uh, reach into the healthcare community and work uh, to uh, begin to share more around interoperability from the social and human services, public health side. And we have a big mural gallery where we will be showing uh, and hopefully immersing uh, participants in the kind of work we're doing. And we will be talking about the NIC and we'll be talking about the Let's Get Technical as we go into that, into that event. So, you can find it online, and if you follow us on uh, any of the social media, you'll hopefully we'll see more about that, and we'll do some recap of it. Should be an exciting opportunity, both for us to be able to show and talk about the work we're doing, and also this that you know one of the core ideas of what we're trying to do behind Nick and be, behind the Let's Get Technical here is to try to cross into other domains and to begin those kind of conversations uh, across domain, uh, and we think this may be a great opportunity to uh, continue to explore that. Um, I don't know if anyone is planning on being at that event uh, in October. Uh, if you are, great to raise your hand, let me know. Uh, and if, of course, if you're there, you definitely should come by the mural gallery. That would be fun. All right, uh, just for a few moments, uh, Dave, uh, are you uh, prepared to give just a brief recap of the notes that Nama took last week? Any, any of the highlights that you wanted to discuss? Dave Walsh, are you here? Did we lose you? No, I'm I'm here. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, 
So uh, I was just trying to connect with Brian Book and get him on the call as well. Yeah. Can you send him the telephone number, Daniel? Um, yeah, let me, uh, let me try to do that. Okay. okay. So I'll go ahead and uh, just give a little bit of background. Uh, in uh, recent weeks, we've gone through and talked about specific uh, topic areas. Some of those are, for example, education. Some of those are what's happening in healthcare. Some of those are topics like uh, 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 name um, identification. So finding out if Daniel Stein is the same Daniel Stein in this domain as we know him to be over here. And uh, we started that out and then realized that cross-domain um, access to resolving an individual is a tougher problem. So we're focusing on that a little bit. But one of the areas that we've realized is that without context, a lot of these isolated sharing of information don't make as much sense. So we've been having a discussion, and I'd really love to have people uh, engage in that, um, about having a proof of concept where we actually um, uh, link some of these things together. And my background, as well as some other people that are going to be participating, uh, is from the healthcare domain. And recently, uh, in healthcare, there's been a lot of activity on interoperability, and we're anticipating new rules coming out of CMS for um, publishing services for interoperability, something called FIRE, which stands for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources, that we feel are going to really. Um, uh, energize the information sharing. So uh, the people that have been involved in a group that I'm involved in, the MITA TAC or MITA Technical Architecture Committee, um, have for a long time put together uh, proof of concept demonstrations where individuals can participate at a number of levels. One of the levels is uh, uh, helping to build some of these interoperable services. Some of those are just being educated on how this all works. And some of it is how, how it works in the context of a complete system. So um, cross domain, um, uh, person name resolution is a good example of it. It's one thing to say, yeah, we've got to resolve who these names are. It's something else to put it in context with a system. So what we have decided to do and what we discussed briefly last week was uh, to look at putting together a proof of concept demonstration in uh, we're optimistic that we're going to be getting some people from the MITA TAC involved in it to be able to share the experiences that we've had in putting together a user story and the example that we had two years ago at the Medicaid conference was one where uh, there was a individual who was abusing opioids, eventually went on to heroin, and we put together using these standards, using these fire standards, a care management uh, program complete with consent to share and so forth, where a number of people could participate in that care management in alignment with the standards that are now coming out. So in order to really start to put together uh, a, a, um, a, a true use case of sharing information between the domains, 
we're looking at um, expanding that proof of concept that we've done over the last couple of years and start to integrate it in with um, other domains such as criminal justice or child care and so forth. So not just purely uh, healthcare information, but other information as well. So the goal is really to um, build a proof of concept, define a proof of concept, and then build it, not a complete operational system, but um, uh, have an understanding of what the component pieces are. Think of them as Lego blocks, if you will which are these interoperable services that, uh, that we're gonna be putting together. And uh, some of the people, I don't know, Brian, have you joined the call yet? Yeah, Dave, I see him on, he's just on mute at the moment. Oh, okay. Uh, and I sent, uh, I sent a note to, to Brian's book with the uh, call in number and the other thing. So uh, I, don't see, I don't see him on yet, but I'm not quite sure what his phone number is, so. Hi, Dave. Yes, I, I have found my mute button <laughs> or unmute button. So um, one of the things that we would like to do is have this be an interactive conversation. The goal being, um, does it make sense for us to put together a proof of concept implementation to be able to share information across domains? And certainly, in healthcare, there's a lot of work going on right now defining what the information looks like and what some of the transport mechanisms are to be able to exchange that data and so forth. And we've clearly uh, uh, understand at this point that e in, in other domains, there may be other standards other than fire, NEEM, for example. So some of the activities will surround how we um, uh, exchange information or um, build the capability to transfer or transform the information uh, between domains. So if it's uh, information coming out of a NEEM domain, and it's intended for use in healthcare, how can we transform it uh, to that level? So very much uh, invite uh, conversations in this, uh, your opinions, whether you think it makes sense to actually put together a fairly straightforward proof of concept implementation where we can all either do or learn from the people that are doing. And um, some of the things that I'm seeing is subject matter experts, for example, in education, who will be able to let us know more about what the critical data elements are in education. Uh, so it's the beginning of the process. Brian Book, who hopefully is on by now, uh, has been very instrumental in the healthcare domain with uh, an open source project that uh, he has going on, something called Care Nexus, which the Might Attack has used to implement some of these proof of concept uh, implementations. And uh, as Brian joins us, uh, as Brian Book joins us, uh, uh, we'll start that conversation. So, Brian Hanspicker, would you like to add anything to what I just said? Uh, no, I think that's a great introduction. Great. Um, okay. Dave, let me... Can I jump in? Can I jump in just for a second? This yeah, is sure. Adam Curtin. Yep. Uh, for those who don't know me, which is almost everybody, um, I'm, one of my roles is as communications director for the National Interoperability Collaborative. So, that's the capacity I'm jumping in here. So as we communicate each other, to each other on this call about the proof of concept, please, please jump in. Um, we don't want this to be a, pre a, a lecture. And there are elements of this that will benefit you guys if we do this well. There are elements of the lives that you lead and the work that you do that can inform this project. 
and we really want to hear your voices. So please take that to heart and, uh, and participate as fully as you can. Ask questions. Tell us about what you're up to. Tell us how this can be formed, that it will really help you, or what you've learned that can help the project. Um, and that's all. Um, and thanks <laughs> to everybody for participating. Indeed, we all work better collaboratively, at least within this organization, than as uh, individual um, contributors. So please help us out. So this is Daniel. I just wanted to mention one thing again, just for, especially for some new people on the call here. You know, one of the things we talked about last time and previously was, again, this cross-domain or cross-sector, cross-agency sort of communication uh, and the ability to share information more more effectively. Mm -hmm. And so many of us have come from the social services side uh, and looking to integrate both with public health, public safety, health itself, um, behavioral health. And so that, that has been much of the conversation um, um, that we've been having. And so some of what Dave and Brian have mentioned in the past has been um, uh, you know, it reflects that that particular orientation of how do we explicitly cross sectors, and that's really the, much of the core of what we're talking about. And as I've said in the past, you know, we've organized our world into six domains, and we've subsumed some things into that. Uh, last week, one of the things we did talk about a little bit was, you know, what really clarifying what's included in those six domains. So we put in behavioral health and mental health into uh, so-called the health domain, which I know uh, not everybody really uh, appreciates necessarily. Um, so we're rethinking that a bit in terms of how do you, how do you really uh, portray this very large field that has a lot of connectivity, but, uh, and a, but a lot of uh, granularity without getting overwhelmed with too many details. So I think what, what Dave and Brian, and Brian when they get on the phone, is attempting to do through this Proof of concept is to very specifically start to tie together some of the uh, some of these different domains, um, which is which is great. And there's there's one note that I think uh, that I just see in the chat box here. If you guys keep that open, um, because some people have joined by phone, so we don't know who you are. So I don't know actually if there's a way to put your name in there at all, uh, so we know who's participating. It's great to at least if you if you're willing to uh, turn your video on, that's great. If you're not, then just if you can, uh, I think you can add a a name to your phone, but if not, we'll um, have to see how to do that in the past. Yeah, you can rename your phone number with with your name. It looks like if you just click on it, right click on it. That gives us a, a better sense of who's on the line. Um, all right, so uh, let me just pause for a second before I hand it back to Dave and Brian and Brian. I don't know if Brian is back on yet. Uh, any responses you want to bring out? Um, any questions, any thoughts at the moment before we dive into the proof of concept? Overview. Okay. All righty, um, Brian, are you going to uh, lead this part, or or or, or Dave, are you going to kick off? Why don't Why don't we both interject here, Brian, if that's okay with you? Why don't you go ahead and get started? Um, sure, if you'd like. Um, I think uh, Dave already gave a, f uh, a good first introduction to the Project Unify uh, proof of concept proposal, um, but uh, we'll, we'll reiterate here on the first slide for the proposal that the primary goals are to prototype um, a multi-domain information exchange that um, includes the ability to, uh, as he put it, transform or map between healthcare information, educational information, justice information, uh, et cetera. Um, of course, the actual uh, scenarios that end up getting explored on top of this proof of concept um, will be driven by the needs of, of uh, uh, specific organizations and specific needs. We've already had uh, both the, the, the MEDA um, uh, scenario example of um, a, a person that uh, I think it was a mom that gets in, involved in uh, op opioids and there was a similar one that was introduced a couple of weeks ago here on the LGT call of uh, Maria the Maria use case where uh, Maria was a troubled teen 
um, had been sexually abused, uh, turned to drugs to self-medicate, uh, ended up getting arrested, uh, et cetera, that um, ultimately led to the need for um, uh, um, a cross-domain case management solution that involved the educational uh, system, the justice system, uh, the child welfare system, um, the healthcare system, et cetera. Uh, so in order to actually pull off that kind of multi-domain information exchange, we need a, a system that will enable um, the uh, collection, exchange, and mapping of uh, information between these various domains. Um, and uh, a second primary goal is to demonstrate how we can use existing standards to facilitate that interoperability and ultimately to support the interchange between the human services, social services, justice services, um, and healthcare IT systems. Now, a secondary goal is, of course, to investigate the differences between uh, the requirements for, human, for information exchange for human services and for healthcare. Uh, we, we do expect that there are going to be some differences, but we think in the absence of this proof of concept, we believe, perhaps is a better way of putting it, that, um, that there are more commonalities than differences. The goals, the challenges, and even the technical approach to interoperability, uh, to information exchange, uh, may be the same. And so, you know, a secondary goal is to investigate these differences and commonalities uh, to determine how we can uh, implement a common solution that bridges the differences. Um, and the approach that we are currently considering is to learn and borrow from healthcare interoperability technologies, um, especially these new technologies around fire, um, and see if they can be applied uh, along, with, uh, along with NEEM and EDFI and PESC and all of the other domain-specific um, standards. Uh, to see how they can be applied to the six domains of human services um, to bridge between the healthcare world and the human services world. Next slide. Let me just, uh, let's just pause for a second. I, you, sure. uh, I, I suspect that there may be some people with questions um, uh, or clarifications. So now is a good time to either um, uh, sort of raise those questions if you want further clarification on anything that uh, that Brian has said um, would be good. So we're kind of all coming along here with the same okay, same knowledge. Um, uh, I don't want to make the assumption that everyone here. Go ahead. So next slide. Yep. Whoever is running it. I'm running it. Uh. This is a no, Mark. Just just one quick comment. Um, as, as many of us know from this work, uh, challenges around standards and technology are one thing, but uh, the challenges around uh, policy, in particularly the areas of consent uh, and, and permission for, for, for sharing, are, are quite another problem. Uh, they're 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 almost insurmountable within health 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 healthcare. Uh, I, I suspect they will be uh, e equally challenging or more challenging cross domain. So I, I think it's very important that this proof of, of concept not ignore the 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 the, the policy uh, it needs and imp implications of this work. Especially around consent and, and permission for sharing. I I agree, and particularly given that some of the domains we're working with, um, while um, being driven by uh, regulatory uh, requirements, still don't seem to have uh, the technical uh, concept of consent or consent to share uh, in their implementation. So this is a, a both a challenge but also an opportunity for us to be able to address this as part of our work within the NIC. Hi, this is Barbara Klein. I just wanted to comment on that because I'm dealing with it on the government end, on the legal end, as well as the technical end. 
just in healthcare. So, you know, there's a lot of considerations that you have to take in to there. Luckily, we have some nurses that are in a school dis, you know, in a school system. So that sort of overlaps. But thinking about, I think that's a good point that cross platform is, is an entirely different, getting those permissions is a struggle. So. Yeah, and, this and is a uh, um, comment. Was, my comment was mostly reacting to the slide that's on the screen. I, I just want to make sure that that policy dimension sort of is, is, is more explicit on here, I guess, because it's a real, it's a real rabbit hole. At, at the yeah. uh, at the risk of opening a Pandora's box here, uh, but you know we we need to open this particular box. Um, perhaps something we can can consider over the next uh, month or two is the notion of starting up a third project within um, the LGT uh, group, um, specifically to address. Um, um, privacy uh, authorization consent uh, type issues because they they have to be solved at multiple different levels. You have to worry about uh, getting the right MOUs in place between uh, between agencies and organizations. You have to have right. uh, some notion of you know what privacy constraints or or um, uh, consents are in place for the specific data. At, at a very fine level of detail as well as at, at the gross level of entire records. And then you have to have the mechanism for actually, um, the technical mechanism for actually uh, requesting, am I allowed to see this at this particular point in time? Yeah, Brian, this is Tom Sylvia. Uh, one, uh, one of the good things I think we have to work with to start from, um, I don't know if, uh, Brian Book has made it to the call, but uh, as Dave mentioned earlier in the conversation, a couple of proofs of concept that we've done in the mine attack the last couple of years uh, showing accomplishments and stuff. Uh, there's a very good starting point in uh, the work that SAMHSA and uh, CareNex have done around consent to share that address a number of the uh, I'll say nuanced consent rules. So, yep. granted, all these cases so far have been very healthcare focused. Although, uh, you know, we've tried to incorporate, uh, you know, social determinant type uh, aspects to the story. The consent mechanism is still very fire based, uh, but we don't see that as strength. We see that as a useful starting point. Uh, yep. to try to incorporate some of the other uh, consent needs, especially when we get into areas like uh, juvenile justice, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to point out we do, uh, from if, if we borrow from the work that we've done so far in this next proof of concept, we've got a really good launch pad uh, to work with uh, to work on that form. And there's also work, I, I, uh, forgive me, I haven't introduced myself in a few meetings. Um, I'm the Neem Health Architect, uh, the National Information Exchange Model, um, which is uh, used by, at this point, uh, 14, 15 uh, different uh, agencies and the federal and state governments, um, as well as the territories and tribal and uh, Canada, Mexico, NATO, um, and I'm also on the NEEM Technical Architects Committee. And one of the things that we're working on in NEEM is um, attempting to carry over the, the good work that's been done in the healthcare community and with FIRE specifically um, into uh, providing the equivalent of consent to share um, uh, for uh, NEEM um, uh, domains. So I agree with you 100% that there's good work that's been that's been done. We've got a good starting point, uh, both between the the work that's been done uh, with Fire as well as the work that we're doing in in Neem, and an opportunity to collaborate and drive to a a, a common uh, consensus for how to solve these uh, privacy and authorization problems. And if I could add, the gentleman that uh, spoke just a moment ago, Tom Silvius, uh, 
has been working with the MITE attack on some of these proof of concepts and brought a really interesting aspect to it. I, I would categorize Tom in, uh, as kind of our chief storyteller. So often when we were doing uh, demonstrations, proof of concept demonstrations, they were primarily technical in nature. And certainly there is that aspect of technical, but what Tom has done and what we hope to extend into uh, Project Unify is tell a human story and tell it in a way that uh, includes the technology, but people saying, this is what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, not just uh, moving bits around, but accomplishing uh, something for people. And uh, some of the uh, suggestions that Tom has had recently <clears throat> has been to extend the, um, the, the, the human story to start to integrate, whereas it used to be just healthcare, to start to integrate things like uh, uh, justice and so forth. And he's got some ideas there. So again, when we're looking at this Project Unify, it's not just people programming that we're looking for, although we hope to be able to get some of that and that'll come in two flavors in my opinion. One, uh, with tools like Brian Book is gonna be bringing to the party, which is an open source infrastructure, something that's already there, has got consent to share built into it and so forth, it's not proprietary. Um, and then uh, adding in other facets of the human story saying, okay, now we've got to reach out into the justice records and so forth. So we're looking for a fairly broad swath of involvement from people. Some of it is going to be education uh, experts. Some of it is going to be healthcare experts. Some of it is going to be Department of Justice uh, experts and NIEM S experts. So when you think of this proof of concept and think about engaging in it, there's a broad swath of skills that we need to be able to tell the story and tell it well. Dave, I'd take your, your thought one step further and assert that over the course of the coming year, we're probably going to have multiple different uh, scenarios and their associated user stories that need to be explored. It's not just we're going to have one human story that we're trying to, that we're trying to um, do a proof of concept on, but rather this is just a, what we're talking about with Project Unify, for, Unify is a foundation, a, tech, a technical foundation on top of which we can start exploring these different uh, human stories, these different scenarios, and all of the associated detailed user stories um, for how to solve particular problems. Yep, absolutely agree, Brian. So why don't we pause for just a second and see if people have questions at this moment. Hi, uh, Eric Young from Alexandria Consulting here with uh, the HS Link um, Open Source Human Services System. One thing I, I heard in the description is that there would be some sort of um, middleware like translation layer that Unity would be involving to go between something like, uh, is it Brian Book's um, open source healthcare um, implementation? And then to go from that to uh, some sort of human services implementation, is that a correct statement that there will be some sort of like middleware or some sort of translator, I think I heard the word for? Or the, yeah. The Dave uses the term transform. I use the term mapping. Uh, but uh, yes, that's the that's one of the goals. Uh, one of the technical goals is to enable that kind of mapping. And it's something that within Neem Health, we've been working on mapping from uh, from healthcare, specifically fire resources, to NEEM data elements, um, uh, in, in particular the family youth and, uh, excuse me, the um, uh, children, youth and family services domain, 
um, for, for NEEM, as well as the human services domain, as well as the justice domain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, within NEEM. It seems like um, that there might also be the need for the scenarios that don't include that middleware, where it would just be direct uh, human services agency communicating directly via fire extensions or whatever with a healthcare uh, entity without any kind of either is that that also with the um, review of this of this group? Yeah. yeah that would absolutely make sense and one thing that i want to make uh really clear is the fact that um we're not trying to go out and build one product that fits all uh it's very much more here are the things that need to be accomplished Hopefully, um, the goal would be to have, have them be pluggable components that can go in there like a transformer if we needed to go from mean to uh, fire or something. And there may be another approach to it that could be plugged in. So we're not trying to build one product that fits all needs. What we're trying to do is say, here are the issues that need to be addressed and here's an approach to address them and there may be other approaches to be able to plug in there as well when we get to it yeah, at Dave, the tail end, end of this presentation um is a is a, a very very early draft of an, an architecture diagram that shows that that says look there are a bunch of microservices in essence which are uh, hopefully plug and play when we get to it some of which are, uh, you know, fire oriented, others are neem oriented, et cetera. Um, and by the way, forgive the, the fact that this diagram is nowhere near um, a final and perfect solution. It was done at midnight last night. <laughs> but it's getting better. Were you going to say something else again there, Eric? Well, I was, I'm just thinking that 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 might be great for scenarios where you have sort of like a clearinghouse or a um, what's of, of data or some sort of um, well, what is it like a resource directory uh, and then and then uh, in a community you know you can look for uh, particular funding streams and then dynamically share with them I could see a lot of utility for that but I'm also thinking about like uh, in very very uh, just simple point to point terms. Uh, I think all you would need to have is are some just generic uh, APIs and just for, we don't even need to talk about um, infrastructure or even microservices. Just look, here's the contract that, you know, take it or leave it. Uh, this is what we've come up with. If you think you have a better uh, contract, uh, please help us improve ours or right. I'll propose another. And, and you know, a lot is, a lot is, typically, you know, in the B2B world, right, it's APIs. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and that's all that's needed. There is no clearinghouse for a lot of the, and there are, there are clearinghouses as well for many things, but I'm just saying that a lot can get done with just a simple contract and forget about architecture and forget about it. Obviously we have to have proofs of concept and build out, you know, of this stuff to, to make sure it would all work in the real world. And obviously, you know, implement, you know, what, what would you call it? Pilot implementations and such. But, um, I'm almost thinking that uh, there'd be many, many facets to this project. And, and to, to what Noam was mentioning about consent and all that, you know, obviously a lot of that's also local uh, rules as well that we, you know, that are so far beyond the scope of this. I'm wondering if we can't just kind of hover at an archetypal level on a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then as it's deployed locally, the, the input will filter back up to us um, you know, as far as well, what what needs to be made more flexible to accommodate the vast variety of uh, workflows that may be involved in consent and release of information and privacy and all that stuff. So I'm just I'm just trying to keep it. I, I'm wondering if we can't kind of push things out to the side that don't necessarily have to be like a, a blocker for us to get some forward motion. Yeah. May, may I suggest, and, and forgive me, I don't mean to sort of cut off conversation, but may I suggest we get through the next four slides um, so that we, we have full context of what we're talking, what we're, we're proposing at very least. 
um, uh, and then try to figure right. out how we reorganize it all. Fair enough. Thank you. Sorry, and I didn't mean to to, to interrupt. I just no, 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 no. It's it's good. It's good. I I love your uh, your engagement. Yeah. And, and I think that there are. Go ahead. I was going to say. I think there's some other comments. I think uh, Arvinder is also mm -hmm. saying, "Let's you know, what's the problem?" Said, "Let's keep it strategic for a bit as we go through that." So, ideally, as we get through the next few slides, we can we can agree on that because, to your point, Eric and everyone, there's so much granularity that you know we have to be mindful of creating something that works in one place that may not have total relevance elsewhere. Um, I wanted to mention one thing, and then I'll then I promise to move the slide forward. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> But which is uh, just in the context of what we're talking about here. So we've mentioned social determinants, we've mentioned confidentiality and privacy as well. And I just wanna point out to folks who are on the call here that those are actually other uh, groups that are on the, uh, on the NIC hub. So we've actually have, a, and many of you probably when you signed up, indicated your interest in some of those groups. So there has been a bunch of work uh, going on in that direction around privacy and confidentiality and security. There's also some work going on on social determinants that we can draw from. So as we get into some of these topics, I just want to reference back to say there's other bodies of knowledge that, that are sort of connected and linked to the work that we're doing here, some of which we will learn more about, some of which we will choose maybe to go into some greater detail as we look at the presentations going forward. We want to take a, you know, a deeper dive into confidentiality and privacy, what is happening, who's got some successes, and that's actually some work that we'll be doing anyways going forward. So to be able to draw from the folks on the call and folks who are involved in that work and have some particular successes, and there are some folks, uh, a couple, couple of counties in California that are making some progress in that area and some states. So I just wanna say that you know, we don't need to create all of it, that there's some already there and we can build on some of that infrastructure. Um, and hopefully people will be motivated and excited to contribute you know, their stones to the stone soup as we move forward, so to speak. And Eric, uh, couldn't agree with you more on the APIs and don't get uh, mired in details initially. Understand that the details are there and they need to be resolved, but don't get hung up on them initially. Great. Well, I moved the slide forward. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, uh, so in fact, here's where we get into much of what we've already been talking about, that um, this unified project community needs to include, include both non-technical folks in human services and healthcare um, who help to identify the business uh, requirements, uh, help to find what data models, data use agreements, consent, consent to share um, policies, privacy policies, I should say privacy, not private policies. Um, consider that a, a midnight typo. Um, <laughs> and that, uh, and of course, uh, technical interoperability professionals uh, to uh, identify what the technical requirements are, design the framework, you know, code solutions, um, or incorporate and integrate uh, existing open source solutions. So next slide. Unless you want to stop and, and have a conversation about this as well. I guess I would just say, is anything missing for folks? Anything need for the clarification? It's understood. Uh, the, the only thing, again, it, it might be on a, on a first, further slide, but you know, it's tough enough within a domain, but the issue of ter terminology and semantics across domains it may require some special focus. Well, I would, I would, I would turn to Tammy there since she's our terminologist on the phone. I don't know if you're still here, uh, Tammy. That that's certainly a a major challenge and question we've been addressing for a number of weeks here. I would absolutely agree, and I think really at the core of any of the interoperability solutions that that anybody comes up with, really, you've got to have that that single source of truth or those standards that are going on. Um, it's so important, especially when you're dealing like you mentioned, across domains and everyone sharing that data together, you've got to be on the same version. You've got to be on the same um, type of code system that you're talking about and even providing that mapping 
and you, you're, you're using mapping in a totally different way than I am, but, but mapping a source concept to a target in some way. And, and even between standards, between customs and standards, it's so very important um, to, to start out that way, to have a good uh, framework for that. That can be really a foundation for everything that you build on. But it also piggybacks into all of the things that you do for social determinants of health, for, um, for any consent policies that you might have, any of those things, because you can really group and put together those codes that are used for specific use cases. So when you're thinking about it, please do, yeah, look at terminology as a foundational layer, not as an add-on that's a nice to have. This, it really should be a must have when we're talking about moving into the future and, and making sure that we, um, that we really encompass and, and take into consideration all the language that's out there. I agree, and this is Brian, you have my apologies for not having included it from the start in the architecture diagram that's, that's um, coming a few slides from now. Um, and, and I know as well, if not better than anybody, the importance of, um, of terminology and terminology standards um, in healthcare. Yeah, thank you. And, and I have to drop off in about five minutes. I have another call. And so, and, and it's really funny. I was getting ready to type in there. I'd like to see that architecture diagram where you see us going in. So um, I'll, I'll look for the updated one. And I'm sorry, um, you were about to say something. I just was gonna ask you whether or not you have seen or you're seeing any cross domain efforts in this area with uh, uh, standardizing or harmonizing terminology. Um, oh. Maybe a longer conversation, but that would be useful to know where that's actually happening um, to reference. Well, it, it is yeah. happening and it's happening in the uh, health information exchange community. We're also a member of um, Chic, yep. and uh, we have clients that um, are at the HIE level that are implementing our solution at that HIE level, at, at the higher level there. So when all of the data is coming in, they're able to normalize standardize, but also um, providing them access to be able for their, those individual organizations to be able to do some of that mapping work. Um, so it, it it really is very effective at that HIE level, but if, if organizations can do it at the lower level, then the HIE wouldn't necessarily have to do that. But yes, cross domain, absolutely. We are seeing that a lot in the uh, HIE community. Great, thanks. Yeah, well, and, of course, and even, even, beyond, even beyond that, that's of course the purpose of NEEM is semantic interoperability. Yeah, I would, uh, uh, we could probably take a page from the uh, Da Vinci Project playbook also, Daniel. Uh -huh. Just, uh, to be helpful. Uh, they've got a body of work around this going on right now too, so um, that'd be a helpful resource. That would be uh, great. If you have, um, if you, um, you know, two things. One is if you can make a note of that on the on the site or or, or put a, a link to it. You may have already done that, or somebody may have already done that. But that'd be a great one to to capture for us and and uh, make sure we're looking at that if it's an, if it's a, the work has already been done in some areas. Um, so I appreciate it. Well, and I'll just underscore for a moment that uh, our goal is um, not to invent something that has already been invented. If the Da Vinci Project is doing something that has value that helps us move forward, then let's leverage what they are doing. So it's, it's much more... Um, not trying to reinvent the wheel, but rather look at the uh, universe of standards that are out there now, get the subject matter experts, for example, education, who can help us focus in on that, and bring it all together into human stories to show how uh, the bringing together of that information uh, provides real value. Great. Okay, uh, very quickly, um, on the technical goals here, one of the uh, prime technical goals is to enable existing healthcare software developers to attempt to apply their interoperability skills for human services. And that's going to involve um, SMART and FIRE 
Uh, it's also going to involve, I think, HL7B 2.5.1, because even though fire is the future, uh, right now the majority of uh, healthcare providers are still using HL7B 2.5.1. So if this is going to be useful to anybody uh, out in the, out in the uh, immediate uh, healthcare uh, world, we need to be able to support uh, 2.5.1 as well as fire. Um, and identify the technical components for a modern cloud-based secure information exchange. And there's an awful lot packed into that phrase. Um, but that includes um, defining uh, data models and the transformation or mapping between data models for different domains um, supporting multiple exchange protocols uh, specific to the individual uh, domains um, and defining uh, appropriate security services and their associated policies and uh, also leverage the work of recent standards initiatives both in healthcare and human services including smart on fire and neem health and this new concept that Dave Walsh had suggested of why can't we just create a fire um, extension resource called a NEAM message and exchange NEAM messages using the fire protocol, which isn't all that big a stretch given that most NEAM implementations use a basic RESTful API, uh, very similar to what uh, fire uses for its RESTful um, implementation. And that would enable us to actually use Smart on Fire for exchanging NEAM messages um, and uh, allow us to leverage a lot of the implementation work, a lot of the design work that's been done in the Fire community uh, for human services information. Now, either next slide or conversation, well, either, either way. Well, that's definitely a very minimally viable product. There was more to that slide originally. All right, I'll give you the rest, right? <laughs> I don't remember it having built like that, but when I designed it, but okay. All right, now it's over. Go. <laughs> I, I think the, the, the basic idea here was, um, Let's try to build it as uh, components that are easily replaceable. I think of those as microservices, uh, given my architectural background. Let's make sure we define APIs to make it easy for um, multiple implementations across multiple domains, multiple application solutions, solution applications across multiple domains to actually interoperate with uh, this system. Um, support multiple information exchange models support that should be multiple information exchange protocols not models protocols uh, again a, a midnight typo um, and the example being 95% um, of the health current healthcare providers use um, IT systems based on HL7 v2.5.1 but fires uh, will become the new de facto healthcare exchange standard um, we need to be able to work with the current standards while understanding where the technology is going and allow easy uh, migration. So next slide. And uh, the notion is that, is that as part of this framework, we will have the ability Look at that beautiful framework. Um, we will have the ability to um, uh, to define services and, and data elements associated with specific domains that can be integrated in with the system over time. So we don't have to build it all all at once, um, but that we will document those in a service catalog uh, that will both enable alignment be be alignment between domains you know, oh, you've got a definition of something called the patient. We need to define something called a client. Let's see if we can make our client look as much like your patient as possible so that we can easily map, transform between um, uh, patient demographic information and human services client demographic information, for example. And of course, also uh, 
that service catalog will provide a guide to application developers uh, attempting to implement new innovative applications. The big, the big reveal? The big reveal. And here's a pretty midnight picture. I would, I would, I would just provide the caveat that I stuck patient and client matching down at the bottom in its own separate little uh, world there uh, because I didn't want to presume anything about um, the other project that we have going on and that I'm also participating in in uh, patient client matching um, and really wanted to be able to throw this over the wall to that project and say, guys, what does this look like and where do we put it in this project unify picture? I'd expect it to be somewhere in the domain information exchange APIs and models box um, in between API services and um, actual data models. Um, because before you can get at the healthcare data for an individual patient, for instance, you need to know whether or not you're talking about the same patient or somebody different. Yeah, and initially the uh, name matching didn't have as much of a focus on the cross-domain piece of it. Uh, but more recently, the cross-domain aspect of patient matching or person matching has become a real focal point. And it's a great example of issues that we need to address uh, for uh, interoperability. And by the way, assume that the words in the boxes are representative rather than prescriptive. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, for instance, um, I've got um, open ID there for security, but there are a lot of other things that have been going on for um, authentication and authorization that could easily be thrown in there instead. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, OAuth uh, as a separate element uh, to the right of SMART is um, a little um, slightly incorrect because OAuth is actually used by SMART, for example. So you would expect in a proper layer cake architecture model that some of OAuth would be underneath um, some of the SMART box, for example. So use this as uh, representative of the ideas rather than prescriptive of what's calling what else and what is going to live in this system versus what do we throw out and use something else instead. Another example, EdFi and PESC. Um, those, were the, those were the hot properties in 2012, the last time I looked deeply at the educational world. Um, they're probably other things that are the um, the uh, uh, standards du jour for exchanging information exchange of educational data. And many of those approaches, OAuth 2.0, for example, will continue to evolve. So we need to think of them, uh, as Eric was saying, uh, like APIs and so forth, uh, to be able to evolve as those standards evolve. So, uh, Dave and Brian, what what response would you want to have to this? I know this is a first version. Um, it, it, in a sense, is this your, or is this the sort of the overview of the component parts and pieces that uh, that will be relevant to cross-domain work? <laughs> yeah, this is the first shot at it, or maybe a second shot since Dave's version was the first uh, yeah. uh, attempt. And this is my attempt to take his, his version and make it a little prettier. Mm -hmm. Of course, in the process, I've lost them some things like the end users. Sorry about that, Dave. Not a problem. If it wasn't midnight and I really had to get it sent before I went to bed, I, I would have made it smaller and fit some users in there on both ends. I do have a vision that uh, while you may have direct end users to the uh, your healthcare data system, for instance, or your child welfare 
case management system on the bottom side in place of the client matching protocols. Think of some, some stick figures down there as users. Uh, that we probably also need to have um, stick figures for users uh, directly integrated, interacting with um, the Project Unify box at the top, which I, which I think was uh, suggested earlier that um, we might want to have a user interface to Project Unify um, in addition to it being simply a clearing, an information clearinghouse. Right. I agree with that. So why don't we open it up for a second uh, to get people's thoughts? Uh, do you think it's generally a good idea, something that needs to happen? Again, we're not looking at replacing anything like uh, HL7 or FIRE or anything. We're looking at how we bring this together so we can have the cross-domain exchange of information. So um, does anybody have any initial reactions to this? Yeah, I had a quick question about uh, what I heard. Did I hear you say you want to be HL7 2.5 backward compatible? Uh, I think that... Uh Certainly to be able to support HL7 2.5.1. We have had a number of organizations express an interest in uh, having that support since that's what they happen to use um, in, in their everyday life. Um, while they're all interested in fire, and we all view fire as the, as, um, uh, the great hope. Um, that there still is a need if we're going to be, if this, if this proof of concept is going to be relevant um, to um, many existing providers right now, we need to be able to provide that, as you put it, backwards compatibility. I don't think so, that those folks, yeah. those hospitals that are using 2.5.1 consider it backward at all. It's very backward. I mean, yeah. I was under the impression 2.7 was much more common, and of course, almost nobody moved to three. Um, but 2.5 right. is definitely right. backward. Um, that, that having been said, I think that if there were unlimited resources, you would do everything you could do to make sure everybody was on board. But I'm also fond of the idea that you skate to where the puck is going, um, and everybody's going to have to migrate to something else for other reasons. And if this was going to be a completed project in a year or even two years, I think you could make an argument for doing some backwards compatibility. But I think that particularly when you start to think about how long, if, if you can use healthcare as a guide, how long interoperability is taking in healthcare alone, I'd be very surprised if we're done with this project in five years. And so I think that in terms of optimizing resources, we would be better to focus on fire, as you suggested early on, particularly if it's reasonable to include a hook to name through fire. I would tend to go fast and quick and easy rather than worrying about backward compatibility. And once you've demonstrated it in one, hopefully it's just another reason for people to migrate forward. Yeah, actually, uh, this time I, I wanted to kind of throw in here um, just sort of an, an overarching, uh, I'll call it architectural principle uh, that should probably guide everything that we do, uh, not only from the backward compatibility issues that we were just being discussed, but also from an adoption point of view and meeting people where they are. Um, I think there, there's a, uh, the concept, I, I call it being multilingual. And uh, if anybody on the call has, uh, you know, ever worked in a, uh, you know, TPA type environment before, uh, this would be familiar. Um, the, the reality that we're going to find a common denominator that everybody can adopt is probably not realistic in today's marketplace, at least within, you know, as far as for the foreseeable future. So when we're, when we're talking about a concept of being able to transport different types of messages, different standards, 
I would add to that also different versions of different standards. You don't necessarily try to be everything to everyone, but you pick a short list that covers a wider swath of, of the people that you're trying to connect. Uh, so if you, you've got uh, issues all the way up and down the stack, it's not just which version of HL7, it's which version of TLS, it's which version of everything else. And so, um, you know, maybe there's a, a wise choice a subset of those options, but the overarching concept being uh, to think in terms of being multilingual in everything that we do. Does that make sense? It does. No, I'd, I'd agree with that. And certainly when you look at this architecture spec, you'll notice that on the, in Project Unify, the, the Neem RESTful API, the Neem Web Services, Ed5 Pesk, and you can just put ellipses there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are, um, are, are all in, in a, a light color as interesting possible futures certainly something we want to incorporate architecturally, but not necessarily something we're going to implement. And if I probably should have reordered the HL7 v2.5.1 and fire and name on fire, since clearly we're likely to be starting with, you know, some fire open source software that we then embroider upon. And whether or not we get to the point in the first few months of being able to embroider 2.5.1 in there is is questionable but i certainly want to ensure that we are not excluding 2.5.1 or any other non-fire protocol so that we don't in in essence architect ourselves into a corner especially around the data model transformation so I agree with what everybody said, but I still think, you know, when there's limited resources, you have to prioritize. And, and again, if you're looking at a minimally viable product, um, timing is going to be one of the key issues and trying to guess where everybody's going is going to be one of the other key issues, but including all of those other options on the development path. That absolutely makes sense. But you're going to have to start with, you know, again, as was said, one standard in each place and, and see if you can get each standard among the different domains to communicate with another, even if it's just for proof of concept. Yeah, we don't know what the resources uh, are that are going to be made available to us at this point. So, um, you know, there were, it is likely that we are going to have to um, focus based on the probably limited resources, but until we know what those resources are, overly constraining the project at the point of proposal, I think, is premature. So let me, uh, let me jump in there because we're, um, we're approaching the bewitching hour here. Got a couple more things I want to do. Um, is, um, you know, sort of very, be very explicit about next steps on this. So, um, you know, this was an attempt to sort of outline um, uh, the project, the proposal, um, and Dave and Brian, um, I know that um, I haven't explicitly said that, but I think one of the things you're, we've talked about is, you know, identifying other people who want to learn more and potentially uh, be part of the, uh, you know, the, um, the, the ideation, development, and, and, um, and project team here. Uh, and I'll make a suggestion in a moment, but I just wanted to just sort of pivot to that because we do have one or two more things we want to talk about. If you want to say a little bit about that, that'd be great. So I would, I would just uh, ask people to think a little bit. If you want to speak up now, that's great. Uh, there are some people like Tom Silvius, a storyteller and so forth, that uh, I think we want to get involved early. Uh, Eric had some really good points. If there's anybody who would like to speak up that they'd like to start to volunteer in some capacity here. And that could be as a subject matter expert for a particular domain, for example, or a technology person. I don't, are, are you on the line, Brian Book? Yeah, he may not be nope. on the line. So Dave, one of the things I think we can, one way to do that pragmatically uh -huh. and for everyone else on the call here, 
is what we can do is we can set up a project team on the NIC uh, uh, hub. Uh, for those of you, you should be familiar with that. If you're not, let me know or email me or call me or ask, raise, your, raise your hand. But when you go onto the NIC hub, you'll see across the top menu, you know, pr uh, projects. And right now we have one project on person matching uh, that has been going on. There's some work happening there. Was alluded to earlier. We'll set up another one. I think what we ought to do is have a you know sh kind of a short white paper, the thing that you guys have been working on, and be very explicit about people who uh, are interested in exploring or joining or participating, and making that available so that they can uh, identify themselves either through that or we'll set up contact information so the people who want to join uh, will be able to do that. We can get a sense of that core team. Um, and whatever charter that might go into that, so that um, there's a there's a solid team of folks who want to um, participate on some regular basis, and those who may want to um, pop in and out at different times. Um, does that make sense? Does to me. Does to me as well. Great. Well, I I'll also mention that um, for those again, for however familiar you are or you're not. With the with the hub and with the let's get technical, there is a you know when you signed up, you I put some details about what your interests. There's also a a member uh, 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 option. You can find out who is a member of the group right now, and you can uh, certainly search through that both on the let's get technical and then also on any of the other groups. And I think we're approaching something like 800 members at this point in time. Um, so there's a, I think it's about 100 or so on the let's get technical. So you can see who's on there and you can communicate on that uh, particular part of the app uh, with other folks. So Dave, uh, Dave Walsh and uh, Brian Hanspicker, you easily just be able to type your name in and say, hey, I'm interested in joining. And then we'll, we'll make that known. And ideally we'll, we'll have a core team and be able to move forward on that, make progress. And then uh, whatever the right uh, timing is for that meeting, uh, that'll probably be in addition to these meetings uh, so there'll be a work a work group that that gets put together and then reports in periodically uh, to this uh, to this weekly call. So any other last uh, last minute things you guys want to say, and then I'll just move quickly to the next uh, couple two slides I have in terms of what I have here. Nothing uh, for me. Just one quick note from Eric Young. If uh, if you need a human services open source analog to Brian Book's health. Uh, care side of the uh, of the equation of interoperability. I'd be happy to um, donate some resources from HSLink to help uh, to have proof of concept on the human services side. We're mostly uh, HUD housing. Uh, we're not representing HUD. We're a vendor uh, in that space, but um, we also have generic um, uh, human services capabilities that that might be useful. Um, just to put that out there, that you know, if you need. Um, open source implementations on the human services side, that's, that's also Excellent. something. That's great, Eric, thank you. Just then we can start an auction. Okay, I got Eric for 100, <laughs> who's coming on next? <laughs> Feel free to step up. Great, okay, uh, just a few more things I wanted to uh, mention here, one is I shared last time with you um, a list of um, potential uh, meeting topics, and uh, these are being worked through as we go through it here. Uh, so you'll see a variety of them, and I think I even heard today a couple more that we may want to include in here um, in terms of uh, providing uh, you know, some more specificity around some of the particular pieces. And so we're reaching out. Uh, we'll hopefully in the next week or two sort of uh, finalize this. There are clearly more here than um, uh, topics here that, that are, um, you know, possible to do this year. So we'll spread those into next year. I, I suspect what we'll do is kind of run, there's a couple of, you know, obviously holiday sessions will cancel this group, um, but then we'll uh, probably sort of take a breather at the beginning of December and then come back in January. Um, but some of these topics that are coming up, uh, Paul Warmley, who's on the call now with us, We'll uh, be talking about the public safety domain, which is one of the six domains on the 25th, if I've got that date right, Paul. Um, and we'll yep. be sending out a meeting invite for that as well. 
we're in uh, discussions now with a couple folks um, on uh, social determinants, on public health. Um, uh, also, we uh, I spoke with Ann Flagg from the APHSA last week at the ISM conference, and uh, we'll have a, a, we don't have a specific date yet, but sometime in mid, late to uh, November, we'll have a Family First Prevention Act, uh, which has a huge impact on child welfare and human services. <laughs> and then you can read on here. Uh, one thing I will point out is we did have a, a brief overview of the TEFCA um, Trusted Exchange and Common Agreement a couple weeks ago. That is actually recorded if folks want to hear that, but we learned recently that uh, uh, Marianne uh, from the Sequoia Project is actually holding an orientation to their work next Monday, um, and I think there's a registration that's still open for that. So if anybody is motivated for that in particular, I think Marianne will be uh, providing that overview. And then there's another number of things. Uh, the Gravity Project uh, with uh, Evelyn has expressed interest. We're looking for a date there and some of these other ones that, uh, that you can see on here. So, um, uh, and there's a couple of other topics includes, uh, including some more on the policy side, like how do we use data, the abusability of it. Uh, Greg Bloom brought that up and I think it's particularly useful. And also um, uh, issues around um, early care and education and also race equity and diversity uh, as we do this work, making data available and accessible. So you'll see more of this, we'll be posting this and then we'll be reaching out. If you have other suggestions or thoughts about topics, feel free to uh, share that with us. Um, and we talked about the cadence on that. So um, Paul, very briefly, if you're still on, do you want to uh, uh, just say a quick word about what you're gonna cover in the public safety one? Sure, I'm gonna to try to talk about how law enforcement and public safety agencies communicate with these other domains, what the intersections are, and, and then what kinds of standards are unique to the public safety and justice world that have to be uh, uh, considered in the framework that we're talking about. And then uh, try to talk about some of the activities that are going on in public safety and justice around interoperability that might uh, be bodies of knowledge that are helpful to what this group is doing. That sounds uh, great. Um, it, Hudson, are you on the line with us? So uh, uh, Hudson Harris has agreed to help um, help navigate and curate some on the social determinant group and uh, we'll be hearing from him more uh, along with Karen and Noam uh, who have a strong interest in this area. So um, we'll be uh, again developing that. Again, whether that's part of Let's Get Technical or if it's part of the larger NIC, we'll be able to use that as a resource. And uh, again, for folks who are uh, uh, new to the call here, if you're still on with us, we will be posting this presentation on the, on the site coming up. And you can learn more about the NIC at the URL that's embedded in here as well. And so I think that's uh, what we got covered today. Uh, if there's any last minute comments, I wanna thank uh, Brian and Dave for really working on this together and getting this uh, together in, in record, record time.